So good morning, chat. So today, I uh, hope everybody is doing well. Today, our clinical case is going to focus around a 75-year-old female who comes into our clinic um, for renewal of her Tiazac and her aspirin. Um, so first and foremost, what medication is Tiazac? So if that doesn't come to your mind right away, I'll give you a little bit of hint that will help our American friends, won't really help Canadian residents whatsoever. It's also called Cardizem. So if that's not ringing any bells, the problem I've presented with this case is I've actually given you the trade name, which we talked about before. Trade names oftentimes differ country to country, but I'll give you another hint then. So Tiazac and Cardizem, the actual chemical name is Diltiazem. So what class of drug is Diltiazem? So if off the top of your head you said diltiazem is a calcium channel blocker, then you would be correct. However, again, if you said that diltiazem is a calcium channel blocker, but you are also astute to remember that it is a class four antiarrhythmic, that would be an even better answer. And why do we wanna know that? It's more about rec recognizing what patients might be taking certain drugs for and, and how those drugs interact and how they actually act from a mechanism of action perspective. So having said that, there's generally two broad classes of calcium channel um, blockers. Those are the dihydropyridines and the non-dihydropyridines. And diltiazem is in which one of those classes? So diltiazem is a non-dihydropyridine. Um, and how does it act specifically? So as its name entails, calcium channel blockers bind to a calcium um, receptor and inhibit calcium from flooding into the cell. And in doing so, calcium usually results in a contraction. So if you prevent that from coming into the cell, you prevent contraction, which leads to vasodilation, which actually lowers blood pressure. And in the heart, you actually exert a chronotropic effect. It actually lowers the heart rate. So then it comes back to this specific patient and you ask yourself, well, why is this patient taking this medication? There is a little bit of a hint. The reality is she was also on aspirin. Um, and when you actually ask her why she's taking this medication, she stipulates that she has some type of heart issue. Um, on further questioning, you have come to re understand that she actually has underlying atrial fibrillation. And what is atrial fibrillation? Um, atrial fibrillation is an inappropriate or improper beating of the actual heart. So typically what ends up happening is a heartbeat is initiated in one structure that's located in the right atrium of the heart. And that structure is called the sinoatrial node. So essentially that's known as the pacemaker of the actual heart. So the sinoatrial node initiates a pulse and the rest of the actual cells then actually fire in response to that and your heart beats in a rhythmic fashion. However, in atrial fibrillation, other cells initiate a beat and the heart gets multiple signals. And what ends up happening is an inefficient beat. Um, so essentially, as opposed to beating um, consistently, you get essentially this going on through the heart or a fibrillation. And why is that a problem? Because when you're just fibrillating and it's not pushing the blood out, you get stagnant blood. And when you get stagnant blood, blood can tend to clot. And that can be a problem because if it clots in the heart and then there is an effective beat, you then push that clot to somewhere else. And that can lead to um, a stroke, which is what we try to prevent at all costs. So getting back to atrial fibrillation, how common is this actual condition? So in Canada, it occurs in about 200,000 Canadians. So about one in 200 individuals. And your countries will vary in terms of how common this is based on, again, risk factors for atrial fibrillation. And what are those risk factors? So what is the most important risk factor for atrial fibrillation? And that actually is hypertension. So high blood pressure is the most common cause, um, followed by things like coronary artery disease and congestive heart failure. So why it's so important to make this diagnosis is because um, you wanna make sure that you're not missing anything underlying that might be going on. So once you achieve this diagnosis, you then want to sort of look at and sort of say, well, what do we do to maximize the care of the patient? And this focuses around preventing that potential towards having a clot. And if you remember nothing else from this video, the most important number that I want you to remember is how much do we actually reduce the potential of having a stroke if we actually anticoagulate the patient? So we recognize that atrial fib increases your potential to clot and we talk to people about taking the appropriate anticoagulation and they start it. Do we stop 100% of the strokes? Sometimes you can think that that's the case. You put somebody on something and you think, wow, they're now protected. But the reality is we only reduce the amount of strokes by two thirds. So we can prevent 66%, almost 70% of strokes by anticoagulating them. So that's an important number, 
but you always have to remember that is by no means an absolute number and people can still have strokes even when they are anticoagulated. So how do we determine which patients we actually put on anticoagulation and what is enough anticoagulation? So this patient came in on aspirin and the question becomes, is that appropriate? Now, do we have a scoring system to determine whether that amount of anticoagulation is, is appropriate? And oddly enough, we do. So this has been labeled under an acronym called CHADS-VASC. Um, I'll probably put that up to this side. So as acronyms go, each letter stands for something specifically. So for CHADS-VASC, the C is for congestive heart failure. The H is for hypertension. The A is for age greater than 75, and that one scores two points. The D is for diabetes. The S is for stroke, so either a TIA, which is a trans ischemic attack, or a mini stroke, a stroke or a thromboembolic event of any kind. That one also scores two points. And then you have vascular disease, like a prior heart attack or those type of things. Age comes in again, so if you're between 65 to 74, you score a single point. Um, and then the last one is actually sex, um, which is if you're female, you actually score a point. And based on that scoring system, we've then looked at the potential for a patient to actually have a stroke within the next year. And so here again, we go into numbers that are relatively important if you're gonna explain things to patients. Um, so in this particular case, if the patient had a score of zero, you need to know what is their risk of having a stroke over the course of the next year. And that percentage risk is actually 0.2%. So you have none of those risk factors. Your score is zero. About 0.2% of the time, people will actually have a stroke even though they have no risk potentials. If that score goes up to one, the number goes from 0.2% to 0.6%. So because those numbers are so low, studies will actually show that it's reasonable to just put those patients on aspirin, which is what this patient's on. However, when you go from one risk factor to two risk factors, that number jumps from 0.6% to 2.2%, so almost quadruples. And the studies recognize that because that risk is higher, at that stage, we should use a higher level of anticoagulant. So then it becomes an argument about, well, what do we use? In the past, we used to use something called Coumadin, and not that we don't use it, we still use it. Coumadin is something that is a very effective blood thinner. But in the recent number of years, we've had access to a new class of drug, which is called either a NOAC or a DOAC. Um, the DOAC stands for a direct oral anticoagulant. And the advantage of these medications over um, Coumadin really stems down to one particular issue, which is the actual risk potential. And the risk of having an intracranial bleed um, when you're on a DOAC as opposed to a Coumadin reduces by 50%. And so because of that, we now have arguments about whether we should be putting people on DOAX versus aspirin versus nothing. So if I look at this particular patient, she's a 75-year-old female who comes in for renewal of her aspirin and of her Tiazac. So by her nature, she's 75 years of age. So if you remember that scoring system, she scores two points for being 75, and she's obviously female, so she scores another point. So she's already at three, which puts her at about a 3% risk of having an event. So she should technically be on a higher strength anticoagulant. So she should actually be on something like Pradaxa, um, or she could be on uh, Xeralto, which is Rivaroxaban, or she could be on Lixiana, which is a Doxaban, um, or she could be on Eliquis, which is a Pixaban. All of those are what we call DOAX or NOAX. And she should be counseled as best we can about the risks of, of not being on those and why we want to put her on in the first place. So we then entertain that process with this particular patient and sort of say, you know, this is the situation. You should potentially be on something that's more effective anticoagulating your blood because otherwise you run the risk of having a stroke. But if we have that conversation with the patient and she's not interested in actually taking her medication, what do we actually do? So this is where, again, you always have to keep in mind if you're the practitioner that what we're trying to achieve is the best possible outcome for that patient. But you have to avoid the potential towards taking things personally. There's another acronym that I like that I came across from, a, it was in a psychological reference, which is Q-TIP. And I don't know if I mentioned this in the last video, but Q-TIP stands for quit taking it personally. 
So when people refuse to take the advice we have, you shouldn't be upset with that or take it personally. You should just understand potentially the patient isn't ready for this. So you could sort of recommend the fact, present that data for her and sort of say, listen, this is the situation. Um, I'm worried about you because you're at risk of having that potential stroke. Um, and because of that, we should probably try to thin your blood a little bit more effectively. So maybe you wanna have this conversation with your family doctor, or you can come back and we can have that conversation again and see if you can convince her to sort of consider that in and of itself. Um, and why that's particularly important for this patient, it turns out that this patient is also a smoker. Now, as we talked about in the last video, how much does smoking increase her risk of having a stroke as well? And that number is actually 200%. So when you factor in that she's a smoker and her individual risk factors for coagulation, it's even more important for us to have this conversation with her. And bringing up the smoking issue brings up another issue, which is these scoring systems, do they have limitations? As you're in this environment more frequently, you'll understand that there are those type of limitations and you sometimes have to factor those in. So why doesn't the CHADS-VAS scoring system consider smoking? I've never quite understood why that is because as a clinician, we know that that is also a clotting potential and we should consider that as well. Another one that doesn't factor in is underlying cancer potential. Every practitioner who's out there recognizes that cancer is a hypercoagulable state. So if a patient of mine also had cancer, but let's say their CHADS-VAS scoring was only one, I might be pushed towards sort of saying, hey, we either have to have a conversation with the cardiologist or we really should consider taking a higher strength anticoagulant because that risk potential is a little bit higher. So these are things that you wanna be considering as your front line because you're gonna be the one who actually sees these cases. And it doesn't mean that you have to handle that there in the, in the moment. You can certainly make that referral to cardiology, but this patient will be better served if she's made aware of those particular risk potentials um, and advised of what her options are. So consider cases like this because they're important and you will see them and we'll do another case at some point in the future. Take care. So I just wanted to add an addendum to the case that we just went over. If we were actually gonna put her on a DOAX, if we were gonna start that blood thinner, we should be aware of contraindications to that medication. Um, so specifically from a practical perspective, if we're doing frontline medicine, we would always ask about tendency towards uh, bleeding. Um, so if she'd had a previous exposure to blood thinners and had a bleed, we'd wanna make sure that we were aware of that. Uh, if she had a mechanical heart valve in place, that's a contraindication. Um, and so is a prosthetic heart valve if it's just put in within three to six months. There's some soft data that shows that uh, that shouldn't be uh, something we look forward. So that would be something you should be aware of. Um, malignant hypertension is another one. So if blood pressure is uncontrolled, you, would be, you have concerns. Um, and if the patient was thrombocytopenic, so if their platelets were down, and that's something you might want to check before you start this medication. Now, practically speaking, there's a couple of others that you should be aware of. But if the patient's in front of you, um, aortic dissection is one of them, and they're clearly not dissecting if they're sitting in front of you comfortably. And if they have an active bleed is the other one. Now that one does require some questions. You'd wanna make sure like no blood in her stool, dark black stools, but for all intents and purposes, active bleeding, typically patients are unstable. So you would ask about it, but it's one that you're not gonna run into as commonly. So that's something you should be aware of as well. So just keep that in mind. Thanks.